All right, I want to talk to you today about spiritual warfare, the subject of spiritual warfare. A lot of people think about this, and uh, if you're saved, it won't be too long before you start getting attacked spiritually. So how do you combat the forces of evil, the forces of Satan? That's what I want to talk to you about today. And uh, we're out here, there's a 100% chance of severe thunderstorms, and there's still some blue sky up here, but uh, over here it's starting to get kind of dark. So Lord willing, we'll be able to finish the sermon outside but uh, if it starts to get, uh, the storm starts to come, we're going to have to go inside. So let's start out here in Ephesians chapter 6. Of course, this is the, probably the most well-known portion of the King James Bible, the New Testament for a Christian, when it comes to spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. It says here, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Your enemies are not people that you can see. All right, they're just bodies of flesh. Now, they can be used of Satan, that's true. But your real enemies are spiritual forces. The unseen spirit world that surrounds you. Okay, right now, there are spirits in the air all around you. Okay, they're around. Now, sometimes they'll influence people to do things and to try and stop you from your work and things as a Christian. But the question is here, how do you, as a Christian, how do you fight against these spiritual forces? All right. Look here at verse 13. Wherefore, let me just stop there for a minute. Whenever you see scripture in your King James Bible, and then the next, another verse, it says, wherefore, it's saying, you're wrestling against spiritual forces. Wherefore, in other words, therefore, wherefore, you know, this is what you have to do. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not just part of it. The whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. All right, Standing, by the way, means that you're holding your ground and you're not moving. Christianity, Bible-believing Christianity, is about discovering the old paths, the way people did things back here in the Bible. Thus saith the scriptures, you know. And then you stand for that. You don't compromise and change. And There is no such thing as progressive Christianity in your King James Bible. All right, you should be living as Christians lived 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago. That doesn't mean, you know, obviously they didn't have video cameras and YouTube back in the first century, but they wrote letters and they preached. All right, and that's what this channel is about. This channel is about preaching the word. This is not about entertainment. Uh, if you're looking for entertainment, if you're looking for some guy that's going to entertain you, go someplace else. You're not going to get it here. All right, so. Your responsibility, your first and foremost responsibility when it comes to spiritual warfare is to make sure that you are standing for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Not how can we conform our faith to the current needs and desires of a lost world. That's not it. Stand. That's the first part. Okay, verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let's see where I'm reading to here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am also and for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You are called to be a soldier in this life if you're a Christian. All right. When you get saved, you are brought into this spiritual war between good and evil, God and the devil, heaven and hell. See. God is a God of distinction. God is not a God of, of blending together and lukewarm and things like that. Lord hates that. So 
as a Christian, you have to understand there's a spiritual realm out there that's trying to deceive people and send them to hell. And you have a responsibility to fight against that spiritual realm. And we just saw the different pieces of armor there. Now let me show you here 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You say, are we really supposed to fight? I mean, can't I just be a conscientious subjector? Can't I be a pacifist in this battle? Kind of stay off the, the lines of battle and just kind of, you know, if I, if I don't bother the enemy, maybe they won't bother me kind of a deal? No. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy. Or wait, am I in 1st or 2nd? Sorry, not quite with it here today. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll get it yet. Verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now look at verse 3 here. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Did you know that there is a lawful way for you to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? And an unlawful way to do it? You see, the unlawful way for you to do the work of the Lord is to use the world's techniques and the world's ways. To be like the world, to win the world, you know, that whole thing, that's not of the Lord. The Lord says, this is the way it's supposed to be, according to the Scriptures. You know, you're to be like the, the believers there in Berea. They search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Right? That's how you're supposed to do it. Come back to the sword of the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of people, there's a whole other movement out there of people that when it comes to spiritual warfare, they're almost practicing witchcraft and professing Christianity while they're doing it. You say, what are you talking about? Well, they're coming up with all these unscriptural things that don't appear in the Bible. They're not striving lawfully, you know, and they're coming out and they're doing this thing, pleading the blood. There's no pleading the blood in the Bible. That's not in there. And they'll go and they'll plead the blood over their vehicle and they'll plead the blood over their house and they'll plead the blood and they, they know that there are cultists in the area and they'll send the blood like to attack them or something, you know. The witches are, are sending spirits of devils and this person sending the spirit of the Holy Spirit and the, and the blood and what is that? Which, it's witchcraft. Okay? You don't see that in scripture. You don't see this thing of pleading the blood. I have a whole sermon on that showing that there are no scriptures for that. And what it is, it's this desire to have this occult power, this, this super power that you just don't understand if you're a new Christian. You know, you're not as spiritual as I am. You don't have quite as much spiritual power as I do. See, that's what these people, these nuts are trying to get through. It's not in the Bible. And if I tell you something and you say, but uh, I don't see that in Scripture, Brian, then I'm wrong. If the Bible says one thing and I say another thing, the Bible's right every single time. And so it is with spiritual warfare. You have to make sure that when you are warring spiritually that it lines up with the book. And if it doesn't line up here, it isn't going to work. And a lot of these people that are involved in this spiritual warfare, I have a spiritual warfare ministry and I can, I can cast out devil spirits and I'm fighting the forces of evil. You look at their actual lives... They're in all kinds of sin. They're messed up. They're using new versions. They're listening to the CCM music. And it's like, but wait a second. I thought you were this spiritual giant. You know, it doesn't work. No. It has to be in line with Scripture. It's very important to understand that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll turn there next. And here's where we're going to start getting into the key to spiritual warfare in your life. How can you stay in that right relationship with the Lord? How can you be spiritually powerful, so to speak? Not fall into sin. How can you do that? Well, I'm going to show you here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. 
Okay, now remember what it said there in, in Ephesians chapter 6, that there's a war going on. Okay, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, spiritual forces are what we wrestle against. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, though the pulling down of strongholds. Now look at this, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know where sin starts? Up here. Your thoughts. If the devil's going to get you off someplace, it's going to start here, in the thought life. And if you get this thing under control up here, your thoughts, if you can get that under captivity, bringing into captivity, it says there, if you can get those thoughts captured and say, don't think about that. When that dirty thought comes into your mind, you say, whoa, whoa, sorry, sorry about that, Lord. Get out of here. Don't think about that. You know, and you start to sing you know, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you start to do that and you replace those corrupt thoughts up here with the right kind of things, when you hide God's Word in your heart, that's when you'll have success spiritually. It isn't, you know, I had a bad thought. I command in the name of the Lord Jesus that the devil that gave that to me be cast out in Jesus' name. No. Get control of your thoughts. You know, I hate to tell you this, but a lot of times it isn't devils and spiritual things that are fighting you. A lot of times it's your own flesh. And it's something that you just have to get that in, under control. And when you do, those spirits, the spiritual forces that come in and try to attack you and try to get you off, you'll just be able to, no, nope, nope, I'm not even going to think that. Don't even think it. Don't even say it. Don't, nope. It's the thoughts. You want to be successful spiritually, spiritual warfare techni techniques, bring your thoughts into captivity with the book. And I'm going to show you that today. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to talk about the thought life. The thoughts of men. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. Okay, it says here, But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, N-O-E, there is your New Testament form of the word Noah. So as the days of Noah were, so too, uh, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the last days are characterized by it returning to the way it was in the days of Noah. What was going on back there in Noah's day? Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. You're going to see, as you study the Bible more and more, and you look at the way the world is, and you look at things and, and whatever, you're going to find that many times the world really hasn't changed that much. You're going to see that. Like uh, King Solomon said, there's no new thing under the sun. You know, there are different forms of things. In other words, they didn't have cell phones 200 years ago, but it's still communication. People always had ways of communication, of communicating with each other. There are different ways to communicate, but it's still communication. What about transportation? 200 years ago, there weren't any such things as airplanes or automobiles or whatever, you know. But there, people saw out ways of getting from point A to point B. Things really haven't changed that much. And even more so with man and the sinful nature that is in man. And the thought life of people today is very similar to the way it was back there before the flood. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Is the wickedness of man great in the earth right now? Yes. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sounds pretty much like today, doesn't it? Got on the internet the other day and I came up, my home page comes up and it says about this nanny, well this was actually today, this nanny uh, was accused of stabbing the kids that she was watching. 
day before that, there was a woman that was chasing neighborhood children around with a chainsaw. The day before that, there was a woman that has lived on human blood for 30 years. You say, man, things are pretty bad, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Pretty much uh, the, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yeah. Whatever you can imagine that people could do that's evil, it's going on right now in our world. Just like back there in the days of Noah. Another prophecy that's been fulfilled. But you see, where did it start at? The thoughts. It started in the thought life. You need to understand that. Psalm 10. Let's go there next. Psalm 10. Verse 1. I always have to laugh when I hear people say that, you know, the King James Bible's old, it's archaic, it's outdated, no good for today. That's just like saying, you know, I'm ignorant, you know, please help me. I mean, that's, that's what the people are really saying. Because if you read this King James Bible, you'll be shocked at how up-to-date this book is. It's amazing how many of the things that are written about, are. it's just like, look at the news. It's going on. Psalm 10 Verses 1 through 4. Let's read this. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute, persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. That happens a lot, by the way. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Look at this one. God is not in all his thoughts. Did you know a powerful incentive for you to not sin is to have God in your thoughts? You know, I've, ha I've been getting a lot of atheists attacking me on my channel here recently. My one sermon, um, I think it was Anger in the Life of a Christian. I think it was that one. And all these, all these little atheists are coming along and stuff. And you know what they're all saying? I don't believe in God. I'm going to enjoy life. That's what they write. You know what that means? That means they want to sin without having a conviction, without having a conscience about their sin. They don't want to think that they're going to be judged someday. Hey, you know what? What kind of a life would it be produce, or would it produce if you every time you went to do something in your mind you thought to yourself, I'm going to answer to God, to a perfect, holy, righteous God for this one day? Ooh. Hmm. Boy, that'd produce a sort of an interesting result, wouldn't it? I certainly hope so. Yeah, it would. But you see, the wicked, God's not in all their thoughts. You have wicked people walking around right now that can look out here at this and they can say, this all happened by chance. You know why they say that? Because God's not in all their thoughts. They don't want to be judged. And you tell them, you're going to hell, you self-righteous sinner. Oh boy, you're judging me. How dare you judge me? Uh -huh. They don't want to think that God is going to judge them. So they just say, I cease to believe in God. I don't believe in God anymore. Well, that's because you're a fool. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Continuing on here. I really need some place to put my notes up here. I need to build a pulpit or something. I don't know. Psalm 94. Turn there next. Psalm 94. There's a lot of good stuff in this, in this book. Psalm 94. Okay, and we're going to read verses 11 through 16. I'm going to show you some interesting things here. Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. That's what the Lord thinks of you people out there that think you're educated. It says your thoughts are vanity. You know, I mean, just i got to take a minute here. Just think about something. The average man gets older. He goes through his school, public schooling. 
he comes out and he says, I'm going to go off to some college someplace so I can get a good paying job, so I can build this big building, big house, you know. I can be a big man in business. I can have new vehicles and financially successful and retire and travel around, go to vacation things and whatever else, and then die. You know what that is? If you never get to know the Lord in that entire time, in your entire life, it's vanity. What good did it do? I mean, drive down the road sometime, look at an old house and tell me who built it. You don't know who built it. Who lived there 200 years ago? I don't know. You know why? It's vanity. These men that were multi-millionaires back in the 1800s, can you name me who they were? Anybody who was a millionaire in the 1800s? Well, that would have been very, very wealthy back then. You can't name me who they, are, who they were. Why? Vanity. You see, the thoughts that man thinks, what man considers as success, God looks at it and he says, it's vanity. What's it mean? Continuing, verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. Is God rough on you as a Christian? Does he judge you when you sin? If he does, it's because he loves you. Verse 13, that thou mayest, mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. They got what's coming to them. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who shall stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Hmm. You know, that's a question you need to ask. You know, when it comes to spiritual warfare, yeah, you're going to be attacked spiritually, but you're also going to have to fight against evil. And the way that you're going to have to do that, the very first and foremost thing is you've got to get control of your thought life up here. You can't be taken in by the vain things of this world. If you fall for the deceitfulness of riches, you're going to fall. You're not going to get too far. All right. Let's go next to Psalm 119. You know, this is a, the biggest chapter, if you will, in the Bible, even though it's a psalm. But this is the biggest chapter in the entire King James Bible. And interestingly, it's not about salvation. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's not about uh, the love of God. What's it about? The Word. The Bible, God's laws, Scripture, that's what it's about. These people say, oh, you're a bibliolater because you put so much emphasis on the King James Bible. I'm supposed to. Yeah. And I'm going to show you why. There's some very interesting things in here. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You have problems as a young man with lust, with sin, with covetousness. You know how you cleanse your way? By taking heed to this book. This book will get you out of your problems, get you out of your trouble. Not psychiatry, not anything else like that. The book. Look at verse 11, Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. So in other words, if you want to have victory over the spiritual realm, you want to fight spiritual warfare, it's the book. It's not learning some kind of special formula that you can send the blood to attack the devils before they get you. That isn't it. Scripture. And if you get some nut out there that's telling you here's how you fight the forces of evil and you can pray and you can fast and you can do all this stuff and he's using a new version from the Vatican uh, you're dealing with a guy that hasn't quite arrived all right not saying that somebody like that isn't saved there are people out there that are ignorantly using the new versions they don't know any better but I'd get real real suspicious if somebody like that would be presented with the Bible version issue and they would reject the King James I'd get real suspicious about somebody like that okay 
Psalm 119, verse 36. It says here, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. What do you think most about during the day? Covetousness? You know, those thoughts that lead to vanity? Or do you think about the Word of God? Do you meditate upon Scripture throughout the day? You better. Luke 12, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Beware of covetousness. Not, hey, kind of, you know, you might want to kind of watch out. Beware. That's, you know, saying that there's a serious danger in covetousness. All right, look at verse 38. Psalm 119, verse 38. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You have God in your thoughts all the time where you're fearing God. He'll, he will establish his word in you. And you'll say, well, I can't do that. Oh, why not? Oh, come on, are you afraid? Well, yeah, I am afraid of God. And I can't do that because you see the Bible says, and you turn to it. You don't say, there's a devil of alcohol that's about to attack me, and I'm going to plead the blood and send it. Be gone, devil of alcohol! In the name of Jesus, you know. No, you just simply say, I won't even let that thought get into my head. No, I don't think so. Because the Bible says no. That's how you fight the spiritual world. Look at verse 42. Psalm 119, verse 42. It says here, So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Notice again, it does not say, I answer those people that you know, go against me here, that uh, reproach me by my superior intellect. Uh, no. By my lifetime experiences. No. The word. Remember back there in Ephesians chapter 6, what was the offensive weapon? Sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It didn't say, and take unto you your mental powers or the blood of Christ that you can plead and send in to attack things. It didn't say that. You know, it's the Word. The book. And you need to have this book. You know, one of the most convicting things, I'll say this before we continue, one of the most convicting things I ever heard was there was a soldier that was taken as a prisoner of war, and he kept himself sane by quoting Scripture to himself that he had hidden up here. Hmm. If you were taken into some prison camp someplace or put, put someplace, how much of this book do you know? If this Bible was taken from you, how much could you quote? How much of it do you know from memory? It's very important, brethren. You need to know the book. Look at verse 50, Psalm 119, verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Oh, you know what quickened means? It means made alive. All right? When you're lost, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And when you get saved, you are quickened by the Holy Spirit. So you want to say, people say, he's, he's got the Holy Spirit, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, that would be like quickening. Well, where's it come from? This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Huh. The book. Again, it all goes back to the Bible. If you learn nothing else from this channel, you need to understand, I point people here. I am never going to point you to me as this answer for all your problems. I don't have the answer to everybody's problems. I get frustrated sometimes because I, I get people write me and stuff and they think I have all the answers or something. And I do have all the answers right here. But I get frustrated sometimes because it's like you have the answers too. And I appreciate the fact that you know people consider me as their pastor and they, they know I know the Bible pretty well and things. And a lot of times I can answer you, sometimes I can't. But I know one who can answer you every single time. The Holy Spirit and His Word. He will guide you into all truth. 
I'll do my best, but there are going to be times, brethren, you're going to have to outgrow me at some point in time. The thing that we read about there in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is, uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, you better not just be somebody that listens to one preacher and one preacher only. Go out there and you're going to hear error. You're going to hear men that are in error. And you're going to have to sort through that thing. That's the responsibility of a Christian. But a lot of these people go into their church building and there's their pastor and they just sit under the guy for 40 years and they never learn anything. You know, I know a lot of you have testified to that. You know, you need to learn among many witnesses. And it all has to go back to the book. And God can show you things. You don't need a man to teach you. All right? Now, it helps. I'm not against a pastor position. I'm not against a man that can teach the younger and stuff like that. I'm not against that. But I am against that being usurping the authority of the Bible. That's very dangerous. And I get sick and tired of hearing this thing about these people that call up their pastor all the time, any little problem that they have in the Bible. Why don't you search the Scriptures yourself? You know? Oh, but uh, my Protestant Pope is the one that has the infallible word that is passed down to me, and I'm laity, therefore I'm not able to interpret the Scriptures myself. That's Catholicism, people. You know what the Dark Ages were? were? It was a time period when the average man and woman didn't have the Scriptures for themselves. That's why they were so deceived. And we are in the Dark Ages again. Even though there are Bibles everywhere. You talk to the average person that goes to these buildings called churches, they don't know the Scriptures to save their life. They're ignorant. They're foolish. Why? Because they're part of a system that made them that way. I'm going to talk more about that in the future. I want to spoil my surprise. All right, go to the next one. Here, verse 63, Psalm 119, verse 63. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Isn't it nice to be part of Bible-believing Christians? I wasn't for... A lot of the years of my life, I was what would be called a modern Christian, professing Christian. I didn't know anything at all about Bible believers. I didn't know anything at all about people that feared God. Those concepts were totally foreign to me. But now, I am a companion of all them that fear the Lord, and of them that keep thy precepts. It's wonderful. And if you're new to this channel, if you're new to this preaching, you need to come into the full realization that, yes, God has spoken to the English-speaking world through the King James Bible. And you don't need a building to go to. You don't need some ordained pastor that rules over you. You don't need that stuff. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit can guide you into all truth through the book, without a seminary education, without any of that other junk. You don't need that. You need to have a living, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you can have it. It doesn't cost you anything but your time. Oh, and your reputation, you know, among the lost world, which, who cares about that anyhow? But when you get into this group of King James Bible-believing Christians, that's when you've discovered the truth. If you're outside there and you're still using a new version, well, you're using a, a corrupt Bible that comes from the Vatican. And the Lord's, yeah, He can kind of work with you if you're ignorant in that. But He's going to eventually draw you out of that. He can't fully bless you using a Vatican version. He can't. <laughs> Don't talk to me about it. I used an NIV for 15 years. I know. All right? Don't tell me, oh, you're raised, born and bred in a King James only cult, and you never knew anything else. Wrong. I was born and raised in a modern church building. Okay? Don't tell me about this thing of, oh, you're, you're narrow-minded and bigoted. You haven't looked at both sides. Yes, I have. I've lived both sides. All right? Verse 72, Psalm 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Getting some sweat in my eye here. Excuse me. Now, I believe in gold and silver. I do actually have a message on that. I'll probably eventually put it here on YouTube. I believe gold and silver is true biblical money. I don't believe in paper money. I think, I mean, I use it. Okay, it's here. I'm not saying I, I refuse biblical or paper money. No, it's there. 
But I think the true system, and if you go back to the Constitution originally, it was gold and silver. But guess what? If I turned around and I dug through the weeds over here and I found this treasure chest and it had gold and silver, you know, from the 1700s, you know which one's more, or more valuable? The Bible. This is worth more than all the gold and silver bullion on the planet. The Word of God is pure. We're going to see that here as we continue. Okay, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. The word of the Lord is settled in heaven. That doesn't mean that after God inspired the originals, then he called them up to heaven, like raptured them up, and then that's the only perfect word It's up in heaven. God doesn't need the perfect word in heaven solely, you know. He has it down here on the earth available for you today. The words that Jesus spoke, the same shall judge him in the last day. The same will judge us one day. God's going to judge us by a written standard. The book that I'm holding in my hands. Not some Greek manuscripts that somebody has to interpret for me. Or Hebrew manuscripts. No. God's word is something that you can hold in your hands. And he settles it. He confirms it and says, that's my book. Use it. Look at all these other saints that used it. And you can see the fruit that it produced. You can know what my word is. You don't have to wonder. King James Bible. Look at verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers. Hmm. Are the spiritual powers ever with you? Yeah. Think about that just for a second here before we continue. Do you see any people here behind me? Islamic terrorists or, or uh, you know, whoever, whatever other kind of physical enemies we might have as Americans? No. Then how could their enemies be ever with us? Unless they're spiritual. See? Continuing, verse 99 there. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You know, there are PhDs out there that don't know the Bible like a lot of uneducated Christians, you know, hillbillies. <laughs> a lot of Christians out there know the Bible better than men that have PhDs and THDs. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for, for thou hast taught me how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You know how you can tell if something is a false way and if you should hate it or not? The Bible. The King James Bible. You don't need to, to say, well, my opinions, well, I think... I." Does it line up with Scripture? You see, that's how you can fight off the forces of Satan. That spiritual wickedness there. You can fight that stuff off by knowing the Word of God. By having that sword of the Spirit so ready, it's just there all the time. And here comes a Spirit in and He says, Why don't you watch that thing on TV? No. Blam. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Boom. You know? Hey, uh... Maybe the word of God is not true. Liar. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Bam. Just all the time, that sword's ready. The sword of the Spirit's ready to go. Ready for battle. All the time. That's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to hate every false way. You know one of the biggest draws of the lost world is to try and get you to compromise? They'll say things like, well, the Bible's a good book, but you, you can't live totally by the Bible. You know, I mean, you know, you, you, you got to compromise somewhere. Uh-huh. No, you don't. Hate every false way. Hey, could you take it easy? Maybe, you know, maybe take it easy on the Catholics. Maybe you shouldn't be so obnoxious, and maybe you should kind of be a little bit softer. No, the Bible says I'm supposed to hate every false way. 
Are you supposed to speak boldly? You're supposed, supposed to speak the Word of God without compromise. It's how it's supposed to be. And you wonder why a lot of people fail. It's because they back off on this book. That's why. Psalm 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know when the world gets dark, the way you find your way through that world is with the light of God's word? Yep. Very important. Psalm 119, verse 113. Psalm 119, verse 113 through 115 says, I hate vain thoughts. Remember what we said earlier about the thoughts of man are vanity and you should hate covetousness and things? See how scripture ties all together? I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Wouldn't it be something if we didn't know what the future held? You know, if we didn't know if this book didn't say anything at all about heaven or the millennial kingdom or the pre-tribulation rapture, boy, things would be pretty hopeless, wouldn't it? But you see, we do know about those things. We can hope in the Word of God. Very interesting. Verse 115, Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. You don't really have to worry about spiritual wickedness if you're keeping the commandments of God. And by the way, that's going to be next week's sermon. What, which ones of the Ten Commandments are we supposed to keep as Christians? Okay, and are there commandments for New Testament, excuse me, New Testament Christ, Christians? Having some hiccups here. I'm going to show you next week what commandments are given for a New Testament Christian. Okay, Psalm 119, verse 125 through 128. There's a lot of good stuff in this in this chapter here. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I love every false way. Uh, it doesn't say that. I compromise with every false way. Uh, no, it doesn't say that either. Um, I overlook every false way because it would cost me money if I stood against the false ways? No. It says, uh, I hate every false way. Hmm. And by the way, if you're there and you're saying, well, that's the Old Testament, you can find the same thing in the New Testament. You can say that we are supposed to hate evil. Okay? It's right there. Let's see, where are we at here? Let's jump down to verse 130. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Are you simple-minded? That's what the lost world thinks of people like me. You know, oh, you're just uneducated, you know, stupid, whatever, you know. Huh? Huh? Okay. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. You can know more than... PhDs and THDs out there just simply by believing the book. Verse 140 Thy word is very pure therefore thy servant loveth it. The word of God is very pure. Unless you have a new version then it's you know impure. It's not pure. You know the word of God is very pure and you're supposed to love it. Notice the distinction again. I hate every false way. I love the Word. See? Distinctions. Total opposites. That's important to understand. Uh, verse 155. Psalm 119, verse 155. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Hmm. Salvation is far away from these people like these atheists because they don't seek the word of the Lord. They don't want to know God's statutes, His laws, because they don't want to be judged. Very interesting. Um, 160, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. 
God still feels the same way about sin back then and or today as He did back here in the Old Testament. He still hates sin. He still hates every false way. And we should too. Look at uh, verse 161 through 165. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. But it's another good one. People in this world will persecute you because they're being influenced by devils to do it. They'll persecute you, and instead of saying, Oh, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm without help. I, I, what am I going to do? You say, Wow, I stand in awe of thy word. The Bible said all this stuff is going to happen. Wow, what a book. Who cares? People persecuting you and whatever else. Family, co-workers, presidents, whatever. You know, the, some general here recently came out and was attacking Bible-believing Christians and stuff. I don't care. Whatever. I stand in awe of the Word of God. You want to call me some kind of terrorist or fanatic or something because of the book? That's your problem. Whatever. Verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Now again, you know, it's like I said, find a chest of gold and silver coins over here from the 1700s or something, you'd be rejoicing then. When's the last time you rejoiced when the Lord showed you something out of His book? It's like finding great spoil. I mean, think about that, brethren. The God of heaven speaks to you through His Word and relates something in Scripture to what you're going through in your life. What greater joy can there be than that? God in heaven speaking to you. You know? And you get these people, you know, they, they see the publisher's clearinghouse or something like this, and they come to the door and they have, you knock on, you know, they, there's a knock at the door and you come and it's, hey, you win $10 million, you know, hey. And people go, wow, imagine that. It's nothing compared to God showing you stuff out of this book. There's no amount of money that can compare to knowledge of this book and understanding of this book. Verse 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. All those nasty distinctions again. Verse 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Hmm, there's another thing. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You want, want to know another reason why a lot of Christians get off into the wrong areas? Because they get offended. Well, I just don't think that you should have said that about, you know, my business or my, my house or my, my money or covetous or, or whatever. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm offended. You know why you're offended? Because you don't love the law of the Lord. You don't love His Word. You know, and it's funny too because did you ever see somebody that you hit them with the sword of the Spirit and they kind of fall back and, Oh, oh, and they got you see they got offended and then they don't control the thoughts up here and it turns into bitterness and then they come out and they're trying to get you any way that they can and they're trying to attack you what's going on there they're not controlling their thoughts okay they're not bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ God is not in all their thoughts they don't fear the Lord they don't read the word and as a result, they come after you. And the devil comes along. I hate to tell you this, Christian, but some of the worst enemies you're ever going to find in your life are professing Christians. In fact, the worst. All right? The worst enemies I've ever seen in my life have been professing Christians. And some of them are saved. <laughs> That's the worst part. There's a lot of them out there that are lost. Some of them are saved. Why are they attacking me? Because they don't get things taken care of up here in their mind. The Bible says that you're to forgive each other. Instead of forgiveness, they get bitterness. And then they turn and they go and they actually go out there and the Bible talks about a root of bitterness springing up and many being defiled therewith. And they'll go out and they'll spread things and lies and stuff and ugly things around about you. Mm -hmm. Hey, you say, Brian, but you've, you've offended me. That's why I have to expose you, because you have offended me. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing, nothing, nothing shall offend them. Hey, if somebody's wronged you, you know the best thing for you to do? 
move on. Oh, but I want to dwell on it and just, just let it simmer and, and boil. And, and I, that's all I ever want to think about in my brain. Okay, then you'll amount to nothing. Move on. Move forward. you got work to do for the Lord. Don't dwell on that stuff. Psalm 119, or I'm sorry, we're moving on from Psalm 119. Psalm 139. Turn there next. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. You say, boy, I'm kind of getting kicked in this sermon here. I, I've had some bitterness with people and I've had some, some problems and some things. What should I do? Well, that's where we're going to go to this now here. Psalm 139, verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You can get those thoughts confessed. You can get those thoughts, thoughts forsaken. And you can get right back in fellowship with the Lord. But it's a very difficult thing and very convicting for you to go to the Lord and actually say, Okay, Lord, search me. Know my thoughts. And if there's any wicked way in me, correct me. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm supposed to forgive somebody that's wronged me. Show me where I'm supposed to forget about it. It's rough. God needs to be in all your thoughts. Not what's going on in the world and covetousness and I got you know, all, all these vain thoughts that come into people's minds, their career and all this other stuff. Drop it. God needs to be in all your thoughts. Okay, Proverbs 16, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 16. You say, but man, I'm just having a hard time with my thought life, Brian. I, I'm just really having a difficult time with it. Well, here's your solution. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy Thoughts shall be established. Huh. You know where one of the best ways to fight the addiction to pornography is? Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established. That's very important. If you get so busy studying the Word, I mean, go out and get the MP3 recordings of Alex Alexander Scorby or maybe even the old CDs or whatever you want. And just play that thing over and over and over and over again. Just the Word of God playing over and over and over again. Listen to the right kind of music, the old hymns, you know, uh, the old rugged cross and onward Christian soldiers and amazing grace and how firm a foundation and the old hymns like that. Listen to that. Just fill your mind with it. Say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go out. I don't have the bravery right now to actually give the tracks to the people, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to make sure I'm going to go to a mall and I'm going to put tracks in books or in whatever else. I'm going to go out tracting. I'm going to work my way up. I'm going to start witnessing to people. You're committing your works to the Lord. He'll establish your thoughts. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. You commit your works to the Lord. He will establish your thoughts. It's right there. Isaiah 55 Isaiah 55, verse 7. One page too far. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You want to get above this sinful, wicked world down here? Think the way God wants you to think. He'll raise you up above this cesspool that we live in called the, the earth. Okay, verse 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, 
that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. There's never been one Christian on earth that has wasted their time reading the Bible. There's never been one Christian on earth that has wasted their time passing out a gospel tract. There's never been one Christian on earth that has wasted their time reading scripture to a lost relative. You cannot waste your time with the book. You're never going to get to a point, a point in time where the Lord's going to say to you, I really wanted you to go fishing that one day or hiking in the mountains or out watch a movie or something, a Hollywood movie. But you had to waste the whole day reading my word. Why'd you do that? You're never going to hear that from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not going to happen. You cannot waste your time with the book. You can't. Can't be done. When wasting your time comes in is when your thoughts are going to vain things. Your career. Your big mansion. I'd really love to have that new vehicle that I don't need. Those thoughts are vanity. You know what every new vehicle turns into? An old vehicle. You know what every new house turns into? An old house. You're not going to find a house down here that you can build and never needs any maintenance. You're not going to find a vehicle down here that you can buy and it's maintenance free. They're all a waste of time. They're all just a rolling pile of junk. So what are you getting all worked up about that for? This is really truly the only thing eternal on this planet, physical possession that you have, the book. Anything else, you know, there's other things. I mean, hey, you want to come out and you want to walk around in nature and stuff like that and respect what God's made for you. You want to enjoy the day, spend some time with your wife and your kids if you have them and stuff. You want to, you want to go out and spend time with family and go fishing or something. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not condemning that. I'm not saying that you just have to be in the Bible all the time. I'm not saying that. But you know what? If you know the book, it'll be with you all the time. When you go out in nature and you're walking along and you'll say, wow, look at that plant there. Look at that flower there. I mean, here, look at this. You know, the Bible says to consider the lilies of the field, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. This is a weed, a little weed. But it brought to mind scripture, didn't it? You know? Got to give this to my wife here, excuse me. There. That's a good thing to do if you're a husband. You know, go out and pick flowers and give them to your wife. But uh, consider what the Lord made. You know? If you can do something that you can use scripture, and you can go out there and you can confirm scripture with what you're doing, God's for it. God's word never returns void. But well, let's continue here. You say, okay, well, I see how I can get my thoughts under control. I, I can see that and everything else. But uh, what if I don't? What if I don't get my thought life under control? What's going to happen? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll go back there into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read a, before we read here, I want to read a worldly philosophy. I think this was Ralph Waldo Emerson or something like this. Um, but it's a very good quotation here. He says, quote, Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Ah, very true. Might have been a worldly philosopher, but he had that thing right. You see, it starts out here in the thoughts. And when you sow a thought, that leads to an action. That action leads to a habit. Habit leads to character, and a character will lead you to one of two places, heaven or hell. You see, if you get into the habit of fornicating, doing drugs, alcohol, self-righteousness, whatever, 
those bad habits, they'll lead you to hell. If you get into the habit of prayer, witnessing, reading your Bible, that will produce the kind of character that will get to heaven. Of course, you you know believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, the big thing there. But the point is, those thoughts, you commit your thoughts, your works to the Lord, your thoughts will be established. God is in your all your thoughts. That leads you to heaven. All right? And it will lead you into, into the kind of a life that God can bless and God can use. But let's read here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, that's what the whole Old Testament is, it's your example, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. That's a lot of people. Verse 9, Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh, thinketh, the thoughts up here? Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Take heed to what? The Bible. Go back to the Old Testament. Look and see how they came out of Egypt, which is a type of the world, the lost world. Save people coming out of the world, and what did they do? They said, oh, if we could only go back to Egypt. If we had it so much better in Egypt. Dear Christian, when you get saved and you come out of that old life and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, if you start to lust after those things, those vain things of the world, you'll wreck your life. Just as sure as you live and breathe, you will wreck your life. If you covet after those vain things of the world, you're going to wreck your life. And you will lose the spiritual war. Satan and his angels will come in there and, and those devils and they'll start to influence you and they'll start to cause you to be bitter. They'll start to cause you to be covetous. You'll be an idolater. You'll start to be tempted by fornication. And the list goes on and on and on. Why? Because you didn't get control of your thoughts. You didn't take heed to the Old Testament, to the written word of God. Now look at verse uh, 13 here. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So when the spiritual forces are attacking you, and they're coming after you, God's not going to allow you to be tempted more than you're able to bear. And how... Are you going to get out of that problem? By pleading the blood, fasting, praying, you know, casting the devils out? No. Get control of your thoughts. Bring your thoughts into line with the book. That's how you win. That's how you defeat the forces of evil, the forces of Satan. That's how you defeat them. The book. Very important to understand that. Now go to Galatians chapter 6. A couple more places to turn to here. It's getting darker, but so far we haven't been rained on, so praise the Lord for that. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself, think, did you get that? Think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. 
you're going to have to bring those thoughts into captivity. There is work for you to do as a Christian I can't help you with. Okay? I can try to point you to different scriptures and things like that. I can preach to you and show you what the Bible says, the things that were committed to me among many witnesses. I can also commit to you so that you can go out and teach other people. But when it comes right down to it, brethren, you're going to bear your own burden. You're going to have to get through this life on your own, you and the Lord. You can't hide behind a preacher. You have to deal with God directly, the two of you, through his book. We say, I'd like to have a vision. And the Lord spoke to me in the night in a vision. And, and then you say, what was the vision? And it's totally contrary to the book. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. God will speak to you through the book. Written scripture. Very important to understand that. Look at verse 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 through 9 says here, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Remember the thing about sowing there? You, uh, I'll read it again here. Sow a thought, you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Don't think that you can sow to the flesh and it won't come back. It will. Verse 8. He, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hmm. Down here in this world, brethren, you're going to be attacked all the time. There is no, you know, R&R, &R or there's no uh, place where you can go where you're not going to be attacked. This looks like a peaceful place right here. You know, there's no groups of people coming after me and attacking me or anything physically. Nobody protesting me right now. But I'll tell you what, if I let my thoughts go to pieces up here, the devil can attack me right here. I don't have to be in the center city of New York or someplace at a, at a sodomite pride rally or something like that to be attacked. Uh-uh. It can happen anywhere. You know, my foes are ever near me. It's just the way it is. And if I allow those thoughts to start going wrong and to start getting messed up, I've already lost. I'm already starting to lose the spiritual war. And it's just a matter of time before I start to sin. I'll start to sow to the flesh. See? But it starts in the thoughts. That's so important to understand that. Okay, one more place to go to here. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. You want to keep your thoughts in control? Here's how you do it. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, here we go, think on these things. Get the thought life under control. Think on these things. Verse 9, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul writing there, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The key, brethren, to spiritual warfare is not fasting and pleading the blood and all this other stuff. That stuff, you know, fasting I agree with. I, I, I do believe the Bible teaches prayer and fasting, you know. But a lot of this stuff, it's about the thoughts. And if you're going to fall to pieces as a Christian, it's going to start up here. Why? Because you don't have this book in there. You're not spending enough time in the Word. I, the quickest way for you to destroy your life as a Christian, brethren, and I've seen this thing, I've had it happen in my own life, is you put down the book. 
you put it down for a little while and you say, well, oh man, I didn't have my devotions, but uh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I, I just, man, I don't have time right now. You know, I have to, I have to get to work. I have to do such and such. Hey, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, David speaking back in, in Psalms, he talked about that the words of the Lord are more to be desired than food, his daily meat, his daily bread. The book is more important than eating. This book is more important to you, should be more important to you than anything else on this planet. And if you forsake this book, you're going to fall apart. Oh, not me, brother. I'm a, I'm a Bible believer. I've been saved for 20 years now, and I'm a strong Christian. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You can fall. Think about the children of Israel back there in the Old Testament. Here they are. God brings them out of Egypt. All these signs and wonders and all this stuff. And, and there is God, you know, in a, in a you know, cloud during the day and a, and a pillar of fire at night and stuff, you know. And, and there's, you know, they can see the manifestation, physical manifestation of God right there. And they fell. Why? God wasn't in all their thoughts. They allowed the old thought life to go back to those vain things of the world, to go back to Egypt where they had it good. Mm -hmm. You start to forsake the things of the Lord, the book, you're going to fall apart. Guaranteed. You say, how do I have spiritual power, spiritual warfare? By putting on the whole armor of God and taking the sword of the Spirit you need to have this thing to be part of your daily life. It's very important. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for holding off the rain here today. And, and I just pray, Lord, for those out there that they would stay by their King James Bibles. That uh, if they'd hear these false prophets out there that are, that are trying to attack the King James and trying to take them back to the Vatican versions and mix them up all with all these questions and strifes and contentions of words as your as your bible warns about i pray lord that those king james bible believers would would see the real true deception behind that the philosophy that's there and just avoid them lord we don't have to uh, speak in the ears of fools for they'll despise the wisdom of our words as your bible says and answer not a fool according to his folly lest thou be also like unto him you know, the, your word talks over and over and over again about these people that come and attack your word and how we're just not even to have anything to do with them. And so I just pray, Lord, for those Bible-believing Christians out there that are watching this, that they would not be sidetracked, that they would not get off into the lusts of the world, but that they would stay by your word and stand strong no matter what happens. And Lord, if there's anybody watching this that does not believe in the King James Bible, I pray you would show the truth to them if they are saved. If they're not saved, I pray they would get saved and uh, come to you as a repentant sinner. And I just um, I pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, all right, that's going to be it. Real lovely day out here. And, uh, you know, you ought to spend some time I've had this question a lot, by the way. I'll just say this in closing. I've had this question a lot. People say, you know, what am I supposed to do for entertainment? Oh, I don't know. You know, maybe you go for a walk. You say, well, I live in the city. Okay, drive and then go for a walk. Consider moving to the country. Just a thought. You know, if you're always around this lost sinful world it's going to drag you down the bible talks about lot being you know that he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked vexed day to day with their unlawful deeds if the lord's called you to be in a place like that well okay you know stay there work there or whatever but you're gonna to have to work extra hard to be in the book to not get discouraged to not get off where you shouldn't be uh, you'll have a lot easier time if you get away from that lost, sinful world. Sometimes you need to come out and uh, smell the roses, you know. Sometimes you need to come out and look at what God's made. Look at the flowers, look at the plants, look at the trees, look at the birds. Hear the birds singing. Breathe in the fresh air. 
Sometimes you need to do that, brethren. Okay? And if you don't, and you're in a place, and I, you know, let me just say this too. A lot of these places, a lot of these bigger cities now, they have this wireless internet thing, this Wi-Fi. You don't know what kind of stuff's going through your head, and you can't even help it. You know, right now we are at a tremendous disadvantage from the Christians in the first century in that there's, right now, there's television waves going right through me. There's radio waves, there's internet, there's cell phones, there's electric, there's all this stuff. It's bad. And I'll tell you what, I get in near cities and stuff, my mind starts to really get cluttered. And I know that I need to be away from that to keep myself sane. You know, uh, as time goes by, brethren, I think it's going to be more important for Christians to get out, at least into a country-type area. I'm not saying that far out into the mountains as you can go. I'm not saying that, you know. But I'd try to get away from some of those cities, okay? Because I get, I get stuff from people in the cities, and they're having a lot of problems spiritually. I imagine you would, living among that lost culture all the time out there. I mean, I go out shopping at regular stores, and it's so vexing anymore. You know, uh, brethren, we're not invincible. Yeah, we're, we're bought and, and stuffed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God's cleansed us from all sin. I understand that. We have the Word of God, the perfect Word of God in the King James Bible. But you're not invincible. You are still prone to wonder, prone to sin. And if you're out there and you're just all the time around that lost world and all the time around it and hearing it and hearing the music and everything else, I mean, do you ever go to a store and they have the rock music playing and it just is, you're just going, what was I going to get? I, I don't, man, I can't think it. Get away from that environment as, as much as you can. You need to come out to a place like this once in a while to keep your sanity. And to remember, God's in control. You know, look at the flowers. Look at, the, look, at the, look at what God made. Consider the heavens. Look up at the sky at night. Consider those things. Consider what kind of a God it is that you worship. All right? If you don't, and you get away from the book, you're going to fall apart. I'm warning you. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching. And uh, next week, like I said, I'm going to be talking about the Ten Commandments. Do we have to keep the Ten Commandments today? Are there other commandments in the New Testament for a Christian? So, thank you for watching.